Lisa Wade with episode 14 of Dirt Road Divinity and today I am just so stoked to actually be having this conversation on site with Johnny Price Thank here you. at the Shrek Society. Thank you. Yeah, this is this is incredible. And I got to say I've never walked into a gym in my life and found the most incredible book collection. I'm completely envious. Yeah, you know, one of the things we've always kind of tried to do with our our facilities, and we've had four, I think, in the last few years as we've moved and gotten bigger each time, is we always wanted to try and create an environment that was beyond just a standard gym mm -hmm. where you just walk in and it's just weights and machines and cardio equipment. So what we wanted to do is create something where people would walk in and feel kind of a, a very cool Zen vibe about what we were doing, and yet you walk in the next room and then you've got your gym, you know. So I think that's something we've always tried to kind of create with our our gyms just be something different than what everybody else is doing you know? yeah just absolutely ama amazing thanks you know I'm curious the, the kind of the whole point of, of this interview series is the idea that for a lot of us our our spiritual path isn't some neat straight well paved prescribed by somebody else road that sometimes it's kind of curvy and bumpy and sometimes it can be Kind of a mess. Absolutely, you know? yeah. It's a roller coaster. Yeah, right. yeah. And you know, in in the research that I that I've done around you, I'm going to be honest. I'm completely fascinated, completely Thanks. fascinated by what I've seen so far. And I have a feeling that your spiritual path and kind of how you got to the belief systems that you have now is kind of fascinating. It, it you know, it's definitely yeah. been a, a journey. You know, um, my parents weren't real religious, but a lot of my family members were. So I attended church off and on for a, a portion of my life as a child and as a teenager, even to the point where I was kind of called into the ministry in the church that I was going to. You know, um, I got a phone call one day from my uncle and he said, are you going to church Wednesday? And I said, well, I just figured you guys would come by and, you know, pick me up. And uh, I often rode with my uncle and my aunt and my cousins. And so that church that evening, um, the pastor always kind of talked at the beginning of the service and he said, Johnny, are you out here anywhere? And I kind of looked at my uncle and, you know, looked around like, what's going on? And he said, would you, you know, come up to the church? And it was a Pen Pentecostal, kind of a non-denominational type church. And uh, he said, you know, over the past week or so, the Lord has given me a word that I needed to give you. And uh, he just talked about, you know, me being in the church, um, that I would go from city to city and town to town. And these were kind of his, his exact words I still remember to this very day. He said, you will go from city and city and town to town, and one day you will be the planting of the seed of the Lord. And then at the end of this, that statement, he's like, you know, do you accept this word? And, you know, as a, you know, 19 or 20 year old kid, I don't think you go, oh no, I don't accept it. You know, you're I'm like, out. you're like, absolutely. And I have always felt a real spiritual calling in my life. And a lot of times it would be when I was in situations that I shouldn't have been in. Yeah. You know, I'm at the bar with my friends, we're drinking, it's midnight, everybody's wasted, and I'm going, what am I doing here? Like, what am I doing in this, in this place? And a lot of times, I would either call a cab and go home or drive my car home, my friends would be like, what happened to you? Where'd you go? And I'd be like, I just went home, I got tired, and, and I did that a lot, but I think it was my spirit trying to tell me, hey, you just don't belong there, that's just not your thing, it's not your vibe. And so, um, I did a lot of you know, drinking and smoking and a lot of drugs when I was, you know, 15 to 20 years old, 21 years old. And, and by the time I got to that age, I was done, you know. Um, so I did a lot of experimenting when I was younger. And my goal for a long time was I was trying to find the ultimate high. And for me, it was a spiritual type high. Yeah. It was just taking a different path. Like I wanted to see what were the boundaries of the human mind. And I found it one day. I mean, I literally, there was a couple times I found it, but there was some times particularly where I was at the point where I was about to leave my body. I could feel it happening, and I knew if I didn't draw myself back, I wasn't going to come back. I mean, there were some times I actually felt that. And so I, I felt like at that point, you know, I had reached about as far as I could go without harming myself. And I really realized at the same time I needed to go into a different path. And it was a along those same lines I was getting into the church and I'd always again felt a very spiritual side to what I was as a person I just needed that direction so when I went to the church and got called before the church and some of the elders had said some things that the Lord had given them a word about me as well I felt very consumed with that yeah. 
And, you know, I was, you know, going to this Bible college and I was learning everything I could about Scripture. I was reading the Bible, you know, eight, ten hours a day. I mean, I was studying everything that I could and, you know, learning Hebrew and Greek and, and Aramaic and Latin and all these things on the side and just immersing myself. And what happens is you end up having a lot of people telling you what the Lord is telling them. But about you. About me, <laughs> but what you're not getting is what he is actually telling you to yourself, you know. And yes. there's where that detachment started to take place. And so over time, it just kept getting worse because even though I felt like I was needed to be in this world somehow, I felt like I wasn't where everybody else was. And it really affected me when we got to our preaching classes. So every Sunday or Wednesday, wherever we had our classes, the, the, the pastor who taught this class would call us up and everybody had to, to preach on something for about five minutes, you know. Of course, you're taught that the Lord needs to give you the word that you need to preach on. You just don't preach on anything. You have to be led by the word. And so as it got to my, my turn, everybody's going up there every week. But when it got to my turn, I was like, well, I really haven't got a word yet. And he's like, well, what do you mean? You know, everybody else has got the word. I was like, well, I don't know. The Lord is supposed to give me that word and I don't have it. Sorry, you know, and of course I'm getting lectured as to why I didn't receive it or I wasn't open to that. I'm like, no, I'm open to it. Just didn't happen. So, you know, again, I think sometimes we're rushing things that should happen naturally, you know, and uh, it was it, small moments like that that took place periodically over time that really made me look at how people are guiding you when you're, you fail to listen to what you should be doing internally. And here lies the biggest problem that we face in society today is that we are dictated how we should believe about so many things. Mm, yeah. And what we do in the process is we disengage from our spiritual being. So at life, as your life is, is being created, your child's life, my children's life, they're giving something at birth. They're given a spirit. They're given a soul, which is your direct link to whoever created us all. But yet we're told that we need someone to tell us what to think and how to think. And certainly we need teachers, we need guidance at certain points. We can't know mathematics without having a good teacher. But when it comes to our spirit, it's very one-dimensional when we're being taught to be a Christian or to be a Muslim or to be Hindi or to be you know, Buddhist or whatever. It's either that or it's nothing. There's no in-between. You can't cross lines, you can't delve from one thing into another. So it's like sucking your spirituality through a straw. It's very directed. And if you go outside of that, you've made a clear mistake. And then of course, your eternal soul is is in contempt, and now you're you got all kinds of problems that you're facing, and then we live in fear. Hellfire and damnation. And so we have yeah. to step outside of fear and realize that our Creator is probably most likely some kind of universal being that loves everything, not just one race over another, or not one sect over another, one you know denomination is greater than another. But that's what our society teaches us that. You know, if you're not, you know, again, if I'm a, a living in a neighborhood and I'm not a Christian, the guy across the street's a Baptist and the person next to me is Catholic and the person over here is Methodist and you have all these people preaching to me different things, you're going to be pretty confused about what's the right thing to do, you know. And everybody is trying to prove everybody is a little bit incorrect, but what you're believing is a little bit better. And in the process, we mislead thousands of people, millions of people every day by that. And so I think... You know, for us as people, we have to be able to get back to listen to our spirit a little bit more, to what our soul is teaching us. Because, the, again, if you think about it, our soul is the essence of who we are as a person. We have this shell, but our essence is our soul. And it's our connection to everything that we understand, we comprehend, everything that we'll learn, every insight that we have has to do with that. And we need to learn how to, once again, expound that and let it grow and let it flourish instead of stifle. And I think, again, that's where our problem is in society today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you consider yourself now, at least based on, you know, what you put out there, uh, philosopher, sage, shaman, Buddhist, Buddhist warrior, warrior monk, monk, monk in search of truth. That's it. That's <laughs> tell, it. Tell me about you all that. that. That's um, the best tagline I think I've ever seen. You know, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, um, obviously a, a sage is someone who has um, acquired a certain amount of wisdom, mm -hmm. um, wisdom that you can relate to other people and hopefully help lives. Um, a shaman takes a little bit different path. Um, there's a, um, a little bit more, um, you could say, um, 
drug usage involved. And some of that is you're trying to, again, release something from your body and gain something at the same time to raise awareness. And, and I've, you know, I've been out into the desert and I've been to Sedona and I've done the, the peyote, I've, I've done the sweat boxes, you know, I've done all those things in the past. And, you know, it's, it's always just another attempt and another way to try and find a little bit more about who you are as a person. So again, I've experienced some of those things. I've enjoyed it. I've never had a bad experience. Um, I think for me personally, the one thing that I enjoy most about Buddhism is your individual walk to find enlightenment, mm -hmm. you know. And there is, it, it's so down to earth, it's so mellow, it's so chill, there's nothing pretentious about it. I can go to the Buddhist temple and shorts and flip flops and a t-shirt and kick them off the door and go in and, and meditate for an hour and a half, you know, or do mantras or whatever. Um, you know, I can't do that if I go to a, you know, other churches, you know, I've got to go in feeling like um, my best is based upon what I wear, yeah. you know, which is very misleading. You know, your best is about your spirit that you're offering, that's your best. Mm -hmm. And again, um, I think sometimes again just goes how misguided we can be as people. But I think um, Alan Watts said something that was really amazing. And someone asked him when he was alive if he was a Buddhist, you know. And what he said was, well, you know, me saying that I'm a Buddhist is like trying to put limits on the sky, you know. And so again, even though I, I relate to that the best, I still can't say that's what I am totally because then I'm still potentially closing myself off. If we're all seekers of the truth, then we really can't define ourselves as, as one thing because then we're, we're you know, closing ourselves off from the ability to see something if it's there. You know, if I am so closed-minded about my belief system, which many of us are, I'm never going to see the truth even if it's right in front of my face because I refuse to listen, I refuse to see, I refuse to feel. And I'm lost but if I'm guided by something because I, I think it helps me to open up which Buddhism does it helps me open up it doesn't help me close myself but it helps me open up then I might find our ultimate path and some people think they found it you know they clearly do you know and they're very devout in their beliefs I can't say that that's wrong for them but there is a clear calling on my spirit that tells me we are getting it wrong and that we need to change the way we look at spirituality and the way we look at religion and these archaic belief systems that have caused us millions and billions of deaths through our history. And we still fight them today, you know, because it's about proving somebody else wrong. I mean, you look at, you know, Muslims, you look at Christians and how they've been fighting for thousands of years. They're just clearly always trying to outdo each other. You know, my scripture is better than your scripture. Mine is, has more validity than yours does. And, you know, over time, what we see is just a power struggle. Uh, instead of looking at the beauty that's in each one of those, let's get to what it's like when we look at, you know, the clarity of love and patience and understanding and kindness and acceptance, because they're both there in yeah, each of them. Absolutely. Okay, they exist. So let's take out the control. Let's let's take out the damnation. Let's take all the, the things that man puts into that. And you've got two things that are very close to each other, you know, but we don't want to see it because it's about power and it's about control. Um, but yet we still deny it exists when clearly it does. So yeah. this is where we as people have to be aware spiritually of what's going on with us, what's around us. And we really have to learn to unite as a people once again, and we don't. I mean, if you look at the state of our world today, um, and clearly because of you know social media and other things, it's, it's prevalent. It seems like more so than ever, but it existed hundreds of years ago and thousands of years ago. It still was there. We're just more aware of it now, but we really have to look at what we're doing and how we need to change. So we as a society are better. And when we look at purpose, which we always seem to do, what is our purpose in life? It's really to propagate our species, you know. We need to take care of our home, take care of our people so that everybody has the same opportunity to live as we have, if not better. And we've totally forgotten that, you know. We just, like, want to go to work, we want to come home. We have no direction, no spiritual guidance, you know, whether through it's the church, again. But we have to be careful about being guided in the wrong direction. Yeah. But we have to learn to look within ourselves again, you know. And, and I've had these discussions before. I had a guy say, well, if you didn't follow God, how would you know what was right and what was wrong? You know, and I'm like, well, that's like saying someone can't commit an act um, without, you know, being told how to commit an act that's that's wrong. And there are people that clearly 
and we don't understand why always because we don't have all the answers why someone commits a crime even at a young age without even being in an area or an environment that creates that people just sometimes do things they shouldn't now this is where we have to look at where does that manifest from because often what we do is we look at the devil let's say as the culprit okay there's a good there's an evil there's a good there's a bad there's something that's going on that directs our spirit my personal belief is that it, it lives within us okay we have multiple things that live within inside of us as far as spirits go not to say there's 20 spirits but you know you wake up from a, a nap and you're in a bad mood you wake up from a nap or asleep you're in a good mood you wake up and you're sad you wake up and you're happy so there's multiple things that live within us these emotions that guide us and certainly history where people weren't even allowed to own bibles because they were thought to be inferior of the discernment to be able to interpret scripture so it had to be read to them and again it's just another form of control I'm going to tell you I love you but if you don't do this this is what's going to happen to you then all of a sudden you're afraid that anything that you do is being judged at all times so again here's where fear controls our actions um, so the church will control you monetarily and in a very passive way it's going to control you physically and pretty soon you're given, you know, your tithe every week, every, you know, month, you know, however much you can afford. So you're being controlled in so many ways that you don't even realize it. But yet you're told that's what God needs for you to have some sort of salvation. Yeah. And um, one of the things that frustrates me, I think, watching it um, day to day in our society is televangelism and how corrupt it is and how so many people are giving everything that they have their life savings to these people that are flying around in jets and you know driving mansions and and living a very wealthy life when clearly that's not what we're taught right. you know right and clearly that's what christ taught us you know he, mm -hmm. he wanted everybody to put everything away put aside your possessions give your possessions away and follow him in his way of life and so um but yet we don't do that you know we're afraid to give those things away that we worked hard for no i don't want to give that away i want to accumulate those things even more yep. we, and, and again we've, we've all done it you know we work hard for certain things but we can't take anything with us you know and I think the older yeah, we definitely. get as we gain some sort of wisdom in our lives I think there's where you know downsizing and living a simpler life and realizing I don't have to keep up with the Smiths across the street and the Jones is over here and in this way of life to where yeah we have a nice house we have nice cars but we're house broke and I think there are yeah. millions of people that are you know, live, live simplistically and, and not worry about what other people think about you. It's your life. You know, you direct that life in the best way you see fit. I think as long as we're honest and we have some kind of integrity and, and honor in the way we live day to day, that's, those are key factors, I feel. We've lost sight of that. And, mm -hmm. and I, I talk to people all the time about this with our presidential candidates, that when is the last time we heard a president talk about honor and integrity? And we talk about the people and what I want to do, you know, and raising our level um, of existence, not only just from the economy, but I'm talking about on a spiritual level, on an emotional level, something that really makes us think about being better human beings. We don't even know when the last time it was, you know, maybe the Camelot era, Kennedy or something along those lines. But um, we just don't hear that anymore. But we need that. We need that guidance from our leadership. You know, we don't have it. It's like we settle for mediocrity, and then it's like, well, what's the lesser of two evils here? You know, uh, we got one. We're not crazy about. We got one. We really can't stand it all, but yet we've got to vote for somebody. And sometimes I think if we didn't vote, that would be the best stance that we could take because then we're then people are able to see, wow, no one's voting because they don't like what they see across the board. You know, it tells us that we need change. If we just keep voting no matter what, how do we know? How do they even know what we really feel? Mm -hmm. You know, but everybody thinks your power is in your vote. And, and certainly there, it is. But how much power would there be if we didn't? And everybody mm -hmm. saw that we are done as a society. We need leadership. Yeah. And the thing is, is that, yeah. you know, we don't have the brightest young minds in politics because they know it's corrupt. We have all these guys who have been in politics for 50 years who have maybe lost sight of our future and where we need to be going as a country and as a nation, as a world. These are the guys that keep repeating the same, you know, um, leadership role over and over, trying to gain leadership, but the most brilliant minds stay away because they know my, our hands are tied, you know. Yeah. But at some point, mm -hmm. what do my children deserve? And what do your children deserve and our grandkids? And they deserve young, strong, 
powerful minds that have a vision for a better world. And moving forward, we need that, you know. I, and, and just on a personal level, I just don't think there's going to be anybody come down on a, on, a, on a shining horse to save us, you know. I just right. don't believe that. But it doesn't mean I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Creator. Just our version is what's incorrect. And that's what we have to face. You know, at some point, we look at science and we look at what it teaches us. Everything will come to an end at some point. You know, like the sun is going to lose all of its energy at some point. It will go supernova at some point, And everything within light years will be destroyed. So again, one day our planet won't be here anymore. It's just going to be gone. So what we have to think about as a species is how do we move forward? And at some point we're going to have to leave this planet. We have to go somewhere else. And if you go back in time, okay, we're 13.7 billion years old, our universe. If you go back a billion years to, to you know, potentially life forms that existed and where they're at now and where they were then, everybody's had to face that. The question is how many and what percentage have actually made that leap to where they could, you know, go out into space, you know, uh, leave the planet they were raised on, bred on through evolution, whatever, um, and how did they exist to this very day? What, you know, how did they learn to get through that phase of destruction where I think that we're at now? I think we're definitely in a phase of destruction and we either get through this phase or we all perish, you know? Yeah. And this is where we have to learn again, I think, to, um, again, from a, a spiritual side of ourselves, learn that we can't exist without the other, okay? You can't say that I don't deserve the same right as you do and then try to exterminate me and think that you're gonna be able to live on this planet without us all together. We are a unit, we are a people, we are a race that exists together. We all have the same rights, the same opportunity we should to live and breathe and, and, and live wonderful lives. And so, again, we can't get around that. I think if we start trying to exclude different you know, races within the human race, I think we're just destined to failure. At some point we have to accept we have to love, we have to show kindness, compassion, understanding for us all to prosper because without that, I don't think anybody would, you know. Hearing, hearing a man talk about the importance of love and compassion and concepts like that, and, you, and you've mentioned feelings several times, and um, that seems something that is not welcome in a lot of places that, that guys, you know, who exhibit feelings or, or talk about things like love and compassion must somehow be weak. Yeah. But yeah, we got, got you. Yeah. Not a whole lot weak about you, Mr. Powerlifting yeah. Champion, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm certainly yeah. an Aries, you know, <laughs> yeah. so there's not a whole lot that I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. um, and not, not and I'm not saying that in an arrogant sense. Right. I, I try to be as humble as I can, but I think, you know, just by nature, um, due to my astrological sign. It's just the way it is, you know. My daughter's and, an Aries. Um, and so, and my, one, one of my boys is an Aries too. He's just like me. But, um, but I think that there should be something um, as far as our, our emotional side that should be okay for us to exhibit without it affecting our masculinity. Yes. Um, I don't think one should affect the other in a negative way. And I think we, again, it's, it's where we detach ourselves from that side I think if I can see a, a man who's strong, you know, and yet compassionate and understanding, man, that's a man right there. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a person of leadership, you know, someone that, that, that you know, someone could follow, someone could understand, you know, someone could learn something from versus someone who's so, you know, uh, detached emotionally um, and so hardened in spirit that they become unapproachable. Mm -hmm. And then we gain nothing from that, you know. Um, you know, that person loses touch, you know, with themselves. And I think at that point, you know, they have their own problems that they can't fix anymore. You know, they have their own personal issues they can't fix because they're not um, relating within themselves like they need to. We need to be able to be in touch. It doesn't make us weak to be able to address things or to look at things or realize if I show some kindness, that might be the one thing that allows that person to show kindness. Mm -hmm. And if I just did one thing and helped one person, that's all I would have to help in life. And if you helped one person, eventually we'd come full circle. And yeah. all we would have to have done is help one person. That's it. So again, um, it's, it's creating this chain um, in succession where we learn that you know, we owe it to each other to help and help each other prosper and grow as people, but we just have totally lost sight of how we should be on this earth 
because we just get so caught up in lies and being misled. And sometimes we're just so focused on work and taking care of our financial responsibilities that we lose sight as well. And this is where having balance becomes really important. And there are so many of us that have no balance at all. I mean, all we do is work, 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 and then we lose our emotional side. And there are some of us that work because it's nece- it's necessity. We have to work. You know, we have responsibilities. I, I totally understand that. But we can't lose sight of how important it is for us to be a spiritual being because that's what we are. More so than human beings, we are a spiritual Absolutely. entity. <laughs> And we just don't get what we are, you know, we just yeah. don't get it. And we need to start, you know, believing in that again, you know. Yeah, for those of us who believe, which I, I am one, in terms of this transition from this fully, like, 3D touch field, you know, existence into a higher dimensional state of consciousness, um, it's, it's like the time on the planet is right now when we can be making that shift Absolutely. and anchoring into our spiritual self and, and having this experience of what life can be like right. when things like love and compassion and understanding and unity mm-hmm. rather than us versus them, divisiveness, fear, right. are actually taking the lead. That excites me. I'm optimistic for that. Right. And, and we should be because we want that. Absolutely. You know? and, and I think even hearing someone talk about it can get you excited about, hey, listen, we can do this. We can pull this off, you know. Um, but again, this is where sometimes we don't have the unity to keep that bridge gap, you yeah. know, um, to bridge that gap. And so well, we need to be able to do that. And I think sometimes we just lose um, the ability to relate to each other. And, 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 you know, going back to Scripture, you know, the Tower of Babel, yeah. you know, there's so much of that that I see today in our society because mm-hmm. we are dumbfounded. And we don't even know what the truth is anymore. Um, we don't know what lies are. We don't know, you know, from one minute to the next what you're what you're seeing or hearing, what validity it holds or the lack thereof. And I think that we're just walking around in circles, you know, not even understanding where we are at or what we need to do. And we have no leadership, true leadership, that who will honestly guide us in the right direction because I think everybody lies everybody out there is lying all they want to do is be elected and they don't care what they have to do in order to make that happen so they're willing to lie and cheat and use deception and here we are people that are out there working hard every day trying to be good people who don't even know what to do anymore and so again we have to get to a point to where we start thinking about our word and our actions and our integrity and everything that we do and raise our awareness and as far as how we interact day to day in this world and how important that is. And I just think we just, you know, so many of us just forget that. And that's why our crime is high and our murder rate's high and, and all over the world. You know, you just see our world deteriorating at such a high level. Here we have this amazing planet. It's so beautiful and wonderful. So many things for us to be able to share together, but yet we just want to cro- control it and take it away from each other. Oh, I can have this, but you can't? Exploit well, how come, you know? Yeah. yeah, so, and... Um, I just think that, you know, if you look at us as a race of people, God, we're such a warmonger race, but why? You know, why is that? Just genetically, is that how we were made? We're just made to be fighters and warriors or, you know, killers or murderers, you know? But yet we can do such amazing, wonderful things. How do we balance that out? And this is where I think we have to learn, again, about compassion, understanding, and, and, and learn how to make sure we're feeding ourselves what we need to in order to help us become better people. And that should be our goal. Yeah. It's not about being perfect, but if I can be the best version of myself and that helps me gain some enlightenment in my life, that helps me take that next step and that next journey, you know, then that's important. You know, John Lennon once said, I don't fear death. He said it's about getting in, you know, one car into another, getting out of one cab and getting into another car. Mm-hmm. You know, so again, it's just about transition. transition. This yep. teaches us that it's transition. And so uh, I think we need to learn how to not fear transition and how important it can be. Inner power, clearly important to you. The idea of tapping into our own inner strength, our own inner wisdom, inner connection with, you know, the divine within, the divine without, wherever we see it. Um, External strength seems to be important as well yeah absolutely what's the intersection there for you can you tell us a little bit just about how um, for me powerlifting came into yeah your life so for me I was about? I was extremely bullied as a child okay um, hard to imagine now yeah I, mean, I was I was a preemie baby so I was born I think three months to the day wow. 
um, of my due date. When I was born, people just didn't survive, you know, that often. So I was pretty lucky. I think I weighed two pounds, three ounces, or something like wow. that. And so I think I just spent a couple months in the hospital before I was able to go home. So I was always a small child, you know, growing up. I mean, I wasn't like little miniature, but I was just thin, skinny, you know. Um, but I always got made fun of because I was kind of, I guess, referred to as kind of a pretty boy growing up. And I got picked on a lot, got chased a lot. And, um, you know, it got so bad, especially when I got into junior high school, that I would fake, you know, being sick to stay home or I would injure myself so I could stay at home or, you know, you know, make something happen just to avoid being bullied. Uh, and I hated my life there for several years because I got picked on so much that I just could not stand it. I just couldn't understand why because up to a point in my life, I just thought everybody got along with everybody. And I got along with everybody in my school and we were such a cl close-knit little family and everybody lived in my neighborhood. And you no, know, not everybody always gets along, but I just didn't, I never saw that side of what kids can do to other kids until I started having kids chase me home from school or I had these guys who would wait for me to go into the lunchroom every day and uh, they would throw me up against the wall, stick their hands in my pockets, take my lunch money and then you know, I, was, I could go then. And wow. um, you know, so this happens over time and it can absolutely change your spirit and I've had it change mine. And then you become angry and you become disgruntled with life and where you're at, why me, why me? And um, I didn't want that to happen but I could feel it changing who I should be into something I wasn't supposed to be because that's what the world was doing. And so uh, I would go down to the local store down the street, the convenience store, and this is back when you could buy 10 different bodybuilding magazines, you know, and I would save my money, and I always saved my money, and I always bought books or magazines, I never bought a lot of candy. And I would buy them, and I would go home, and I would read every single page, every single article, and I was obsessed with bodybuilding. <laughs> And I was a kid, you know, I was 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. And I used to go to the YMCA and I had friends that played basketball. We played basketball when we were in the league and we would, you know, do all kinds of stuff, play ping pong, just hang out at the local YMCA. And one day I went down into the basement and there were some powerlifters in there. And there was a guy there named Ricky Crane who was a five-time world powerlifting champion, 10-time national champion, and considered by most powerlifters to be the greatest 165-pound powerlifter of all time. And he was down there with a lot of his powerlifting buddies, and it was a steel door and had a little bit of wind, a little bitty window. We'd get on our tippy toes and look through and watch. And I thought, holy cow, that's what I want to do. And after that, I never even thought about bodybuilding ever again. Mm -hmm. But I was young, and I was too young to be able to work out. So I, you know, several years went by, and one day I was at a, a gym called the Fitness Factory in my hometown, and he was there training, and he wow. was training in that facility for a while. And he was getting ready to open up another one of his gyms out on the other end of town. And so I went over there and started training with him. You know, he invited me to come train with him. And I trained with him for about five years, and that's when I started competing. And he taught me everything that I needed to know about how to train correctly and how to, you know, learn how to do movements correctly because technique is everything. It's not about weight, it's about technique. If you get your technique down, strength will come. So there was a, a, a real philosophy behind what he taught me. It's the same thing I teach my clients to this day. I changed it, tweaked it a little bit, but everything that I learned, I learned from him. And uh, Ricky was one of those kind of guys you either loved him or you hated him, And uh, but I always got along with him and I always respected him very much and what he what he taught me to this very day. I, I respect that man greatly. Um, he reminds me a lot of my father, so he and I aren't social media friends because he frustrates me, uh, <laughs> but I respect him greatly. Um, but it taught me everything. And so that's when I got into powerlifting and I competed you know, off and on for about 15, 16, 17 years. Um, I don't compete as much anymore, but I still train every day just like I did when I competed. I still use the same system. I still go into every training session just like I did with the same goal in mind. I want to be stronger every single day. But what that got me as I was a teenager was just gaining size, gaining confidence. And all these guys that used to pick on me didn't pick on me as much um, and then what you have you have is you have parties and everybody's drinking and, and somebody wants to arm wrestle and you know the guy who used to just smash your arm into the table now he can't beat you anymore and he realized well this guy maybe I shouldn't mess with him as much you know so over time then you start to develop a different type of reputation um, now you're someone that people are a little bit more concerned about um, 
and then you see how that changes just based upon your appearance alone. Then you maybe learn how to you know fight, you take some martial arts classes or whatever, and then you change into a different person altogether. And that's when I got into bodyguard work for a while and traveling with bands and doing some stuff like that. And um, but the, the 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 main thing for me was I just didn't want to get picked on anymore. I did not want to be bullied. I didn't want to be picked on because how it affects your mind and your soul is such a bad thing and that's why you have such a high suicide rate among teenagers because people just don't get how humiliating and how degrading that can be and how it can alter who you are as a person and you know when I think about um, what I suffered through as a kid to this very day it really bothers me um, because I know how it affects other people based on how I felt that you will lie you know about being sick or that you would intentionally hurt yourself to avoid going to school and facing that one more day you know and I think sometimes our parents don't realize how sensitive an issue that can be and I'm telling you it is a sensitive issue and if you have a child that is facing that man you know listen to them you know be there for them um, I would pull my kids out of school in a heartbeat if I thought they were suffering through something um, because I'm the protector, I'm their go-to, I'm the person that should always be there for them. So um, I just think as parents, it's tough being a parent, but I think we have to make sure we're watching out for our kids. But um, working out changed my life. Um, it taught me how to be strong. Uh, there was times I probably haven't used it like I needed to, but again, that was part of the learning experience, you know. Um, and there was times I used it to save lives. There was times I used it to help people, you know. And and I've probably done more good with it than I ever have bad. But again, this is where we learn to control our power and the things that we're given, you know. Um, and I tell everybody, you know, for me, working out is this very spiritual thing. I can abuse it and God can clearly take it away from me or I can use it to help people or do good things and hopefully I'm rewarded by that. So again, our mentality often dictates how we receive these gifts or how long we can have them. I'm not 25 years old anymore, I'm not 30 years old anymore, I'm not 40 years old anymore, you know, and I'm still, in some ways, just as strong as I was 20 years ago. In some ways I'm not, some, some ways I don't put as much effort into, but the ones that I do, I'm equally as strong now as I was in my prime, you know. And so again, um, you can't always be defined by a number, you know, because um, then you create limits that you don't necessarily have to have, you know, so. Um, Seems like you're all about blowing up the box. I you know, am, whatever man. boxes yeah, stifling I am. or putting, you know, I, I, yeah, limits. I just think that we, you know, as far as age and growing older, we should look forward to having the opportunity to do that. But, God, if we can do it and feel good doing it, yeah, you know, um, sometimes when I go home, I see a lot of the guys I grow up with, and, you know, all of them haven't made great choices, and some of them have, you know, drank a lot and partied a lot, and, you know, some of them look like they're 70 years old, you know, and I'm thinking, God, I don't want to be that. I don't want to do that. I want to be young and feel young and, and be vibrant. And, and one of the key elements about living a good, full life is continuing to evolve as a human being. Okay. And we can never stop evolving. It doesn't matter if you're 50 or 55 or 60 or 70. You should always try to be evolving and learning something new or changing something about your life so that you feel that you have purpose. As long as you have purpose, you will live as long as you can. But if you lose sight of that, that's where you really see people start to fall off as they get older. I don't want to do that. I mean, to me, life is so precious and so wonderful that, God, I want to live to be 100 if I can. If I can break the world record and live to be 120, I'm the guy that wants to do it. That's me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I tell my friends all the time, it's my life. It's my spirit. If somebody's going to come and try to take it away from me, you better be ready for a fight because I'm just not going to give it up. And I hear people all the time talk about, well, you know, I'm just ready to go. I'm ready to transition. I'm, I am not ready. I don't know that I'll ever be. And at some point, I may have to face that. But by God, it's going to be a tussle, you know, uh, because it's all I know. And I was, I was talking to someone, a yoga instructor here in town, uh, not too long ago, and she had made a post about, what do you fear? And I said, the only thing I fear is death. That's it, you know, because... It's all that I know. I know my life, my essence, my being, my spirit that makes me Johnny Price. That's who I am. I can't imagine not being that person or ever not wanting to be who I am. And so it's probably the only thing that I fear because there's going to be a moment where I transition from one thing to another that I just don't know what's going to be there, that gap, that moment, that instant. That's the scary part, you know. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't believe that there is some sort of eternity, eternity for all of us, because I do. But I just—it's hard for me to have the, the, you know, 
that realization that I'm gonna have to give up something before mm -hmm. I gain something else, you know. Yeah. And I just a little, you know, it's be a while before I'm ready for that. Yeah. Wrap your mind around right. what, what's yeah. that even look like? What's yeah, it feel exactly. like? What's it what's the experience? Right, yeah. Um yeah. I I get that. Yeah. I get that. You know, there have been a couple of people close to me recently who've been either on the verge of death or actively in the death process. And just the the, the abject fear, just the feeling and, and it you could sense it, just yeah. this the deep sense of fear of what comes next yeah. and part of the work I do um, help people through that transition you know the the full soul transition sure. to the other side and it was um, it was just amazing uh, yeah. two years ago two years ago last year last year uh, my husband um, actually passed and it was a situation where he I could tell like in his spirit he was scared. He was yeah. like, w where am I going? What am I doing? And I was like, hey, right. you want to go check it out? What? And so like in meditation, it's like our two higher selves met up and we went to where he was going. And I tell you what, it was hard to come back yeah. because I'm like, wow, this feels really good. I yeah. mean, that feeling of just un complete, unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, right. no matter what. And uh, that was... I'm, I'm so thankful to have had that experience and, yeah. and to have helped him, you know, be able to kind of know before. Right. before you know, and you, and you hear life. stories all the time from people who have who have had near death experiences. Yeah. You know, who have been, you know, clinically dead for thirty minutes, forty five, hour and a half, whatever, who've come back and seen amazing things. Um, the one thing I question, of course, I'm I'm not a skeptic, but my brain just is wired that way. I always question. That most of the people that have near-death experiences that come back, they seem to always be Christians and always see something very similar. But what about other people and other belief systems? You know, and so you know, how do those things come into play? And I've actually done some research and tried to find people in other belief systems who have had near-death experiences. There's not, and there's not that many. Really? Um, you know, there's there's several that are Christian. Um, so again, you know, when you talk to people about that, they'll say, well, that's just kind of a, a learned behavior. It's what you know and what you've been taught. So what you see in the afterlife is parallel to that. Um, not to say that it doesn't exist and not to say there's not some kind of a light and there's not a place, because I, I, in my being, I believe that there is. Um, but it's interesting how sometimes it's like all about this one spectrum over here, but there's a whole other spectrum that there's no information about. You know, yeah. where is that? Yeah. Um, it was not at all like what I expected. You know, and, and the stories that I had heard in terms of people having their near death experiences didn't look anything like that. No tunnel, no big white yeah. light, no nothing. And, um, but it, it just helped me, maybe that John Lennon quote, you know, helped yeah. me anchor that concept in more that, hey, it's, like getting out of one cabin into right, another. Right. Um, from, I, I mentioned yesterday that it, it's almost like you're a walking alliteration. And I love alliterations, right? But the idea of power lifter, philosopher, poet, what's like the intersection of all that? How do you, how do you get all of that I, into one you? I think um, um, my, my girlfriend always asks me all the time, you know, we talk about stuff like this, and I, I say, if I could make a living as a writer, that's what I would be. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my go-to. That's the thing I think that gains me more happiness mm -hmm. than anything is writing and being able to write something that people read and go, wow, I love that, or I related to that. Um, and um, I, I post most of my stuff on Instagram. Sometimes I'll tie it into my Facebook. Most of my stuff is on my Instagram. But... I think to me that's my form of art, you know, um, and there's where, you know, the poet and the philosopher comes in because a lot of what I write has to do with my philosophical belief into how I parlay that into my writing. Mm -hmm. um, the power lifter part came out of necessity uh, and then a passion to exceed boundaries existed within that, that, that realm of lifting. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just not about going in. I don't care about being you know, um, a 350 pound monster with 25 inch arms because there comes a point to where it's just unhealthy. But for me to be able to push the boundaries of my physical limit and see what my body can do, therein lies the science behind your programming and your training and how they are 
intertwined. So for me, there's a philosophical basis between my training and yeah. what I believe and what I write. And so you know, the parallels between the writer and the poet and, and the philosopher and the pilot, they're all kind of united in this one person, you know. Incredible. Incredible. It, it's nice to it's nice to meet people who are clearly multidimensional. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, I, I, I hope that, that that's um, um, that I'm heading in that direction. You know, um, I think um, I don't want to be a one dimensional person. I want to, to be multidimensional and have a lot of things that um, I enjoy doing um, or that I'm learning to do. Um, and again, if I can do something that helps someone, whether it's through my training or helping someone with nutrition or having a different philosophical basis on life that might give them some guidance when they need it the most, it really it's about helping every day. You know, and I think that, you know, as a kid, you're always really selfish because you just want, want, want. And then one day you realize how much you gain from giving back every day. To me, it's the most rewarding thing that you can do, even if you gain nothing in return. Yeah. Uh, there's something so fulfilling about that that um, you just don't want it to ever go away. So I hope, I hope that, you know, the next 20 or 30 years of my life, 40 years of my life, that I can continue to you know, hopefully, you know, inspire people to do cool things that, that people enjoy or it helps them in some way. And, you know, again, it's about purpose. You know, if I can have some purpose, then I'm, I'm okay. If you were to offer, like, one encouragement to folks who might not feel, who might feel like a fish out of water when it comes to their own spirituality, or who might even feel bullied by the spirituality of others saying, sure. you must do it this way. Sure. Um, what would that, what would that encouragement or, or wisdom be? Study many different things. Mm. Absolutely. Do not, do not. And, and again, I'm not saying everybody has an ulterior motive that's negative as far as what you're being taught, but it's so much learned behavior that you feel because you've been taught that way, that it must be the right way. Mm. That's mean you have malicious intent to, to lead someone astray. But we can't just take that for granted because we can all be easily misled, even though our desire is to do right and teach the right thing. That doesn't mean we're going to be right. So I think we have to be open-minded enough to learn many different belief systems and really learn what each of them say that are closely related and learn to push away the rest. So you have to have an open mind um, and an open heart to that because if you don't, you are never going to find the truth. You're just never going to find it. You know, you're going to be miserable. I would rather search my whole life, um, knowing that there's a better way. Even if we don't understand it on Earth, and maybe it's in our next life that we understand. At least I'm searching for it, and I'm not willing to accept what I've been taught because I feel it's it's it, it's just a shortcoming of some sort. Um, and again, it doesn't mean there's not elements of Christianity that I don't love, or there's elements to Islam that aren't great and you know, Islam gets a bad rap because of terrorism uh, in this day and age. But, I mean, certainly I can show you a, a million things that Christianity has done that equal that in, in every negative way. Whether or not um, it's done as much now, but in its history it certainly has. So we can't say, well, we don't, you know, we don't do that now. Well, you certainly have. Um, there's, you know, horrible things that Christians have done to Christians. Um, and other people, um, and Islam is no different. They've done horrible things, and they've done great things. And um, you know, one thing that um, I like about some belief systems is clearly they're a little bit more pacifistic than others. But you know, samurais—they were they were Buddhists and they were warriors. You know, um, and so just because you you follow a belief system doesn't mean you're totally pacifistic. But it right. means that I have the courage to do what I have to do if it calls for that. But in the meantime, I always wish for peace. Um, and I mm -hmm. think that, you know, we all want peace, but if we just lay down, is that what we should do? Or should we be willing to fight for our lives or others if, if it's necessary? Then does that take away from my beliefs? Well, no, it shouldn't. But what we hope for is that we get to a place where we don't need that anymore. And this is where as human beings, as a spiritual species, we have to evolve to get to a place where we no longer do that to each other. And again, this is where can we make it past this barrier that we're at right now in our in our human history where we have to evolve beyond these warmongers, these these people that hate and kill and destroy like we do and have for thousands of years. We have to take that next evolutionary step to get past that. And I think if we don't kill each other, destroy each other the next few thousand years or a few hundred years, I think we have the potential to do so. 
but we have to learn to step outside the box because there's so many of us every day that are just waiting for someone to fly down on a white horse and save the day, and I just don't think it's going to happen, you know. And again, I'm not trying to discount others' beliefs. I just think we have to look at the reality of the situation and realize that, you know, belief systems um, a lot of times are created out of um, inferior mentality to understand the earth and its surroundings and what's going on. So we create these things to give us purpose. And it doesn't mean that they're right, but we're looking for something to guide us. We need a guidepost, so we create something. Or, you know, I like what you guys said over here, but I'm going to borrow a few things from this. I'm going to borrow a few things from that. And I'm going to create my own belief system that's better than both of yours. But where does it gain validity? Okay, well, it doesn't. You created it. You want people to follow it. But where is it really grounded spiritually? It may not be at all. But yet we lose sight of that, you know. And then we just start following it, thinking it's the, it, you know, there's, well, this person created it. He said God spoke to him, so let's just follow along. We don't know it to be true, you know. If I said that God told me to create a new Bible, a new language, and, and people needed to follow me, most people would probably think that was crazy, you know. They wouldn't do it, you know. So, um, but does it mean it doesn't take place? Does it mean it didn't happen before? Does it mean I'm not fabricating? There's so many ramifications and things that could affect the way we believe or look at something. We just have to be really careful about what we do, how we do it. Don't close your mind off. Be open-minded and realize we could all be getting it wrong. And most likely we probably are, you know. And that cognitive dissonance can be a bitch. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You know, yeah. I would rather admit we are totally wrong. Help me find something that's going to help me than go, I'm going to take this to my grave, whether it's right or not. And most people, will, 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 you know, will do that, you know. Take their hands um, yeah. They'll just dig it in and, and I believe what I believe because this person told me this and this person told me this. And it doesn't mean that for hundreds of years we're not being misled and we're continuing to mislead people every day in the process and people are believing something that has no real validity. You know, why does the Quran have less value than the Bible? You know, why does the Bible have less value than the Bhagavad Gita or whatever? You know, so, um, you know, we start comparing scripture and Bibles and, and who's is, has, is more valid than the other. And, and pretty soon it's just about who has, you know, um, who has more power, who has more sight, who has more control. And it's really not about love. It's not about affection. It's just about power, power, power. And again, we just need to lose sight of that because that's all we seem to want in life. You know, we all want power and control and resources. And um, I just think that the, the it's path, exhausting. it is exhausting. Yeah, you know, exhausting. just to think about it, it's mentally exhausting. Yeah. So I just hope that, you know, our kids that are growing up and our grandkids to come can see from our mistakes and learn if we don't change things, we're just doomed as a race. And, 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 and again, when we're looking for a purpose to be here, we should be taking care of this home as long as we can until we can't stay here any longer. We should think about our people and how we can learn so much from each other um, that we don't destroy each other. And um, you know, I'm a minority, so I understand what it's like to, 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 to feel like I'm a little bit less than what other people are at times. And it's funny about America is that, you know, it seems like to me sometimes that Americans don't really like Hispanics, but we sure like Hispanic culture. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't really seem to like African Americans here, it seems a lot of times. We sure like African American culture. It's like we want uh, we want what you have, and we just don't want you here to share it with us anymore. And um, and I hate that because, I mean, I have so many friends from all walks of life, and, and I have wonderful African American friends, and Hispanic friends, and Native American friends, and people that I love with everything inside of me, you know, that are wonderful people, but there are people who just would not take the time of day to understand those people just because of the color of their skin. We just have to get beyond that, you know, and we owe it to each other to get beyond that. And um, I think we just have to learn to value each other and what we can offer. So many things we can learn from each other. And when we close ourselves off and think that we're some kind of dominant species or whatever, um, that arrogance is what's going to cost us in the end. We just have to lose that. And again, this just goes back to love and affection and understanding and acceptance and patience and guidance and all these things that we just sometimes lose, again, that, that will help us if we just hold on to it a little bit more gently, you know. That feels like a perfect note to wrap up on. Maybe so. Right there. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? No, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the conversation. Um, 
I could go on for hours. You get me on my soapbox, and then I would just go and go. So, we need yeah. more soapboxes yeah. like this. In I, my I opinion, hope so. You know? Yeah, maybe we can do it again sometime. That would be so, fun. Yeah. I appreciate your time. Thank you yeah. for letting me I'm come I'm glad you to got your... to come and check out my library and I'm check out our little this. our little pad. And, yeah, and, this and, is uh, fantastic. Yeah, and have this, have this conversation. This so thank is fantastic. You. Thank I appreciate you. appreciate it. Where can people, where can people find you? Uh, we're located in the Pearl District mm -hmm. off uh, 7th and Rockford. We're at 1507 East 7th Street. Mm -hmm. uh, we're called the Shrug Society of Strength and Conditioning, which is an Atlas Shrug reference for anybody that um, has followed Ayn Rand, um, mm -hmm. uh, writer and philosopher. So there's always a philosophical um, uh, undertone to everything that we do here. And, and certainly in the name of our, our facility, our old gym was called the Philosophy Tree. Uh, nice. But when we uh, we moved, we changed the name. When we were the philosophy tree, we actually we had a, a juice bar and a massage therapist and an esthetician, and some other things. So we were all under this canopy of the philosophy tree. Then we all kind of went our separate ways, and we needed a bigger building and some things like that. So we kind of um, thought with this last move that we would go ahead and change the name one last time. So we are the Shrug Society of of strength and conditioning. And we specialize in powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, cross training, and things like that. We do a lot of hybrid bodybuilding. So we train people in many, many facets. And, and you know, the thing for us that we're really particular about is technique and developing a skill set like that we would train an athlete. You know, we want our, our clients to, to be like athletes. We just don't want you to come in and go through the motions. We want you to come in and know that we're trying to manage your time in the best way possible. And with COVID being, you know, something that we're all dealing with, and I've had it, I know what it's like. Um, you know, I reduced my rates all the way down to $100 a month, which is less than $8 a session if you come in four days a week. And so what I'm trying to do now is just be affordable to everybody, you know, so that someone who might not normally be able to afford a, a trainer can do so now, knowing that we're going to help you manage your time, um, help you with nutrition, and hopefully put you on a path where your immune system is stronger so that even if you do get sick, hopefully you're better suited to fight it. You know, you'll live, live another day. So, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. As far as finding you online, you'd mentioned Instagram. The Iron I'm, Sensei, is Yeah, right? I'm the Iron Sensei on Instagram. That. Yeah, <laughs> That's and, fantastic. Uh, thanks. And then, uh, of course, we have a Facebook page, uh, the Shrug Society of Strength and Conditioning. And then I have a, a personal page, you know, my Johnny Price page. And, you know, if you can find me on any one of those places, you can look me up. And I'm normally really good about getting back to people pretty quick. And I like to respond as soon as I can. And, and um, if I can help, you know, people, I'm all about it, you know, so the more the merrier. So, and, you know, one thing about us I do want to say real quick is we're actually a private training studio. We are not an open gym. Mm -hmm. So with people being concerned about numbers and things like that, I think places like mine are going to be really popular in the future because you're never going to walk in here and see more than 8 or 10, 12 people here at one time versus going into a gym where there could be 50, 75, 100 people, you know, depending on the size of the facility. So I think moving forward, people are going to be looking for places like this where they can get the attention that they need and know that it's in a private setting. So, And again, it's a place like this. So, you know, it's like you said, it's not like a normal gym where you just walk in and there's a lot of heavy metal music going on. There's a very cool vibe to it. You know, when you walk in, then you go into the gym, you know, you're going to get your butt kicked, you know, so. No, you're going to yeah. get your butt kicked. But then you can expand your mind. Right, you, you know, while you're building study your philosophy because, and, and religion and, yeah. and theology and <laughs> science and astronomy and cosmology and you know, I was totally all the archaic <laughs> languages, whatever you want to study. Yeah. Phenomenal. So, totally checking out your book collection. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I really appreciate it. To everybody who's been watching and listening, thank you. And uh, we'll see you again next week on Dirt Road Divinity. Thank you.